Welcome back. I've been away a little while, uh, for about six weeks or so, because uh, I've been just very busy around here. We can uh, get battened down for uh, winter, and I just recently got done uh, spending about two and a half weeks putting down hardwood floors in my uh, friend's house. So, I'm back now, and what I wanted to talk about was uh, the topic of Smith & Wesson wheel guns, the Smith & Wesson revolver family. Now, for those of you who are not familiar, uh, I'm a Smith & Wesson armor, factory trained at Springfield, Mass. on Roosevelt Ave back in the early 70s. And uh, down there I spent two weeks uh, in school with master uh, craftsman and gun builder John Contos. He was our teacher. And it was a fabulous time. We learned an awful lot in those two weeks. Uh, we, we worked on, we learned how to build uh, the Smith & Wesson revolver from ground up. And uh, we learned how to service it and uh, to maintain all the different things. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but I worked on hundreds and hundreds of uh, Smith & Wesson revolvers over the years. And uh, I was also a competitive shooter, besides being a, a police, a city police officer. Um, you know, the uh, the Model 10 heavy barrel was uh, 38 Special was the gun that I was first issued, and uh, I competed with that. And despite the fact that it had fixed sights, it was a very accurate gun. It handled very nicely. It was uh, easy in the hand. To uh, it was very swift from the holster, and easy to get on target and. Uh, then I, later on in competition, I wanted to upgrade, so I got myself a Smith & Wesson Model 19. Uh, these days you might know uh, probably more about the Model 66, which is the stainless steel rendition of it that came out later. Uh, but the, uh, the Model 19 was a gorgeous gun. I actually had two of them. I had a, I had a four inch uh, combat magnum, and I also had a six inch uh, barrel, a six inch barrel version of that gun that I sometimes preferred when I was uh, competing on a 50 yard course because the longer sight radius uh, was able to really drill the groups in uh, nice and tight. So my fondness for that uh, Model 19 uh, remains and uh, I was sorry that I, I let them go. You know, times were tough. You know, early, early in my life, you know, a young cop you didn't get you didn't get the kind of salary that uh, allowed you to have too many toys, so I let it go for something else at the time. Uh, both of them eventually went, uh, so I've had a yearning to get another Model 19. I've probably spent the last uh, several years every time I go into a gun shop, uh, you know, picking up uh, various Model 19s from years past. They they would they would drop from production about 1999. Let me kind of, you know, elaborate on that. Uh, in the in the late 90s, uh, no, you couldn't you couldn't give away a revolver. Nobody throughout the 90s, nobody really wanted anything to do with a revolver. By then, people had really become uh, involved with semi-automatic pistols, and uh, revolvers were really uh, they they were littering the shelves of every gun dealer, and they they had very drastically reduced prices on them, and. Um, but, at the, you know, the interest has been uh, resurging uh, in those uh, fine firearms for quite a long time now. Uh, probably for the last 10 or 15 years, there's been a gradual increase in interest in revolvers. Not, not much different than, you know, people, I, I see these ads on TV now, and uh, the feature, you know, people dancing to a uh, phonograph, you know, with a, with a turntable, with a, a spinning platter, you know, so that they can hear music and see the, you know, see this piece of plastic, spin, vinyl plastic spin around, and music comes out. That's what I grew up with. I mean, uh, it's, it's nothing new to me. And uh, I just recently was able to sell one of those uh, phonograph uh, turntable. Uh, and I got a, I got a very, very hefty uh, check for that. And I've got another one to let go one of these days. But, you know, it's the same thing with revolvers. Re the interest in revolvers is kind of a nostalgic thing. It's coming back. People like to see that cylinder spin around. There's a little bit of activity there when they pull the trigger. So, 
it's just a different sort of gun and it's also very field friendly you know for anybody who goes out in the woods if when I'm taking a walk with you know Benny and we go out in the woods uh, you know a semi-automatic pistol is a pain in the neck because every time you fire it you lose a, you lose a piece of precious uh, brass that you uh, that you can't recover once in a while you know maybe out of maybe out of ten shots you might find two or three pieces of brass or something laying on the leaves but you know it's really not the gun for, for going out plinking in the woods or out in the field so you know a revolver is just very handy for that it's beautiful um, and they you know they're, they're, they're very very reliable in all conditions so uh, I wanted to get another Model 19 and as I say I looked around and for years I've been examining them um, I couldn't find one that was in uh, what I would call uh, good condition um, I I see some I see some banter about uh, on the internet about the old the, the real classic uh, old model 19s and and other and other fine uh, Smith and Wesson revolvers and uh, to hear the storyline you know I'm speaking as an armorer now somebody who spent so much time servicing and maintaining them to hear the storyline that goes on you'd think that you'd think that these things were just you know impeccable gems that that there was never any issues with them and that they were a far better gun back then than the currently made Smith and Wesson ha 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 uh, I got to tell you something. Those people perhaps do not know about this is my this is my old armorer's manual that I got uh, from Smith and Wesson, and uh, they probably don't know about. Can you read that? The fifty-one problems. There's 51 problems with the Smith and Wesson that we learn to to fix and how to how to avoid them. I can almost guarantee that every time I picked up a Smith and Wesson revolver from a dealer and examined it, that I was coming across anywhere from three or more, sometimes five or six of these 51 problems. Some of them that had been developed over the years of sustained use. They've been around a long time. They haven't. They haven't been. They haven't been in production for a long time, and and so some of them are well over 50 years old. And even the newest ones hadn't been made since 20 over 20 years ago. So, and a lot of the problems were something which their someone who owned them created. In other words, trying to manipulate, doing a little bit of you know kitchen table uh, gunsmithing and improving. Uh, all sorts of things, um, you know, things like doesn't carry up, stop catches, overhaul, push off, creeps, hammer block, doesn't open or close good, stubs, rough double action, click starting, stop sticks, stop low, stop doesn't recover, point of stop long, loose rod, rod runs out, extractor rough, cylinder close on lug, cylinder run lug, center pin rough, end shake on yoke, cylinder hits closing, hammer rough, hammer hits bolt, hammer loose, hammer bind, Hammer hits rebound, hammer hits trigger, hammer nose hits. Knuckles, that's a big one. I have a lot of, a lot of them with knuckles. You know, people back out that strain screw or they, they, they file it off and the gun ends up with knuckles. Doesn't recover good, bolt locks hammer. Pit locking, yoke stud loose, cylinder loose on stop. Stop doesn't hold, hand sticks, hand long, cramps. Not, that's another big one. Stop comes up too fast. Hand skips, a lot of those throw by. I mean it goes on and on and there's, there's actually believe it or not some of those things when you have one you have you have a, a, a handful of them because they one problem creates the other. I don't like you know I don't like to bash uh, I don't like to bash any gun manufacturer and I, I don't like to lavish unnecessary praise on any gun manufacturer. I like to tell it like it is. I'd like to tell it the way our instructor John Contos explained it to us. It, the, in the real life, there were mechanical instruments that had a plethora of problems that, that could crop up or occur, you know, either 
because somebody mishandled them, maybe they dropped them. You know, police officers live in a rough and tumble environment, and it's not, it, you know, it's not unusual for a police officer to, to bang his gun in such a, such a way where it might be, might be dropped in a fight or something like that. Uh, you know, a gun popped out. In those days, you know, gun holsters were not all that secure. It wasn't very uncommon for a, a revolver to hit the deck. And that created all sorts of problems with those guns. Uh, once, you, once you dropped the gun, invariably you either, you either bent the hammer so it couldn't be caught back all the way. Um, sometimes that wasn't readily apparent. You know, we, we used to tell our guys, make sure if you ever drop the gun, bring it right into me immediately to check it out because there's any number of problems that could occur. Another significant problem was this, the ejector rod. The center, pin, this, the center pin in that ejector rod could get easily bent and then you'd have run out where the, where the center rod, the ejector rod, was not running straight. That can create uh, horrific problems with a Smith & Wesson, or especially because it relied on the locking bolt. That's the little silver, that's the little silver pin that you see inside the uh, shroud or, or on an unshrouded barrel like a Model 10. Uh, the, the barrel lug, there's a, there's a little uh, silver, tapered silver uh, plug there. That's called the locking bolt. When you have run out on that locking bolt, uh, you have tremendously rough double action if you have it at all. You had uh, many, many times you would have an officer come in and complain that he was having problems and I noted that his uh, ejector rod was loose. Loose, loosening ejector rods cause uh, no end of problems. Um, I would have officers come in, and uh, you know the the gun the gun was spitting lead terribly, or maybe it wasn't it wasn't cycling smoothly because the hand uh, was was uh, not engaging correctly on the ratchets on the ejector. Very frequently, the ejector somebody would attempt to tighten up their own uh, ejector rod, and in so doing, did bend the two little pins in the back of that ejector that uh, held it indexed in place and would also permanently damage the, the uh, cylinder because uh, there was a little there was a little keyway on that uh, ejector that that went into a that went into a slot on the um, that went into a I should say a slot on the ejector raw the ejector itself and then that keyed to a a, a small it was a very, very small key on the cylinder. When that got wiped out, it was, it was time to order a new cylinder and new yoke. It had to go back to the factory, actually, to, to be fitted up with a new yoke. So uh, there were, and, and a yoke, for those of you who are, you know, cult and um, uh, fans of uh, other Rugers, uh, you call it a crane, but it's not a crane in the Smith & Wesson uh, vernacular. Well, suffice to say, I could not find in all those years, probably looking for the last seven or eight years, trying to find a Model 19 that was in any kind of condition that I wanted to take home, and certainly it wasn't worth the money that the dealers were asking. You know, they've gotten, they've gotten kind of a collectible uh, price tag now. You know, the prices are running upwards of $700, $800, $900, a $1,000, some fantastically ridiculous prices for pieces of junk. So I gave up looking. Well, I just, I discovered, you know, just in reading and in passing, I, I, had, missed, I had missed the fact that uh, the Model 19 has been reintroduced by Smith & Wesson. Well, to listen to all the, the junk that I see on uh, YouTube, you'd think, you'd think that Smith & Wesson just reintroduced, uh, you know, a piece of junk. Well, I'm here to tell you, uh, I've got one here. I'm going to take you through that, uh, that, that fine weapon and I'm going to show you how Smith & Wesson has vastly improved a very fine product that will be much better and is much better than it ever was. So let's step over to the bench and we'll take a look. Well, the old Smith & Wesson uh, craft paper is still being used. This is not exactly a presentation case, but uh, it's better than a 
it's better than sometimes in the cardboard box. Um, look at that now. This is one handsome gun. Um, I was actually very pleased that uh, this so-called classic now, uh, and it doesn't say classic on the uh, actual gun. It says, uh, just as the old one did, it says Combat Magnum. 357 Magnum, Combat Magnum. Um, and on the, behind the yoke, it says 19-9 rather. And you'll see also there's, there's a difference here. There's a clasp, there's a detent right here, rather than being a plain flat surface. And right here, you no longer have that pesky issue with a two-piece center pin surrounded by an ejector rod. It's, it's, simply, it's simply an ejector now. And we also no longer have two pins that can get wiped out underneath the, underneath the ejector. There used to be two pins underneath here that engaged two holes on the ejector. Those are no longer present and there's no longer a, a fragile little track that ran up and down uh, this ejector that could get wiped out, uh, that, that could spin off and ruin the uh, small keyway that was on the cylinder. Um, instead, it's a very, very rugged, flat surface. It creates it creates a D-shaped a D-shaped hole uh, and uh, ejector. Very, very rugged. Uh, this is not something that's prone to, to go out of whack. But let me grab my. This is over 40 years old. This is my personally crafted uh, screwdriver that I use only on Smith and Wesson uh, revolvers on nothing else in the world. It's hardened, polished, and it fits exactly into the, the screws. So we're going to take this apart very quickly off camera. Uh, if you're interested in how these guns are taken down, uh, visit my earlier video on how to disassemble and uh, maintain a Smith & Wesson revolver. But I'm going to take it apart and get it open for you so you can see inside, and uh, we'll examine all the parts. Well, let's start with uh, the back end of the gun. First thing you're going to notice is that it's got a round butt, very similar. It's the same style round butt that was used in their uh, detective version of the Model 10. The uh, had a two, I believe it had a two and a half inch barrel. Uh, we had those uh, for our for our detective unit. Uh, that round butt is now incorporated into the standard stocks in as I said in that other video, in uh, Smith & Wesson country, you don't call these grips. They're not grip panels, they're stocks. And these happen to be, rather than the Goncalo Alves that I had years back, these are beautiful um, American black walnut. I really like that. Uh, the Goncalo Alves was nice, but uh, I, still prefer, I still prefer the warmth and the look of uh, real, uh, genuine American black walnut. It's just gorgeous. And you notice here also, this scalloped out edge. That is there intentionally uh, for a very, very good reason. When, when competitors began to use speed loaders, speed loaders would not go by the old uh, heavy grips and the old heavy stocks uh, didn't permit them to go by. So guys had to guys had to manufacture their own carved out thing and oftentimes it came out looking kind of crummy. Uh, they, they didn't do a nice job. This here is purposely uh, built for that uh, for that game and uh, does a really nice job. So another thing is too I've noticed that the the main spring uh, has got a straighter configuration. Uh, I think that is going to improve uh, Double action, uh, double action uh, trigger pull. Uh, it's just the 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 arched, the very heavily arched mainspring that used to be in them had a tendency to feel crampy uh, if things weren't just right. Um, now, very important thing that you'll probably notice right off the bat is that you've got this skeletonized uh, hammer. Now, 
people would look at that and say, well, that looks cheap. Well, let me tell you something. That happens to be a, a very precise hammer. I just, I have, I have gone over that hammer with a fine tooth comb. Everything about it is uh, far more precise than they used to be. Uh, it's nicely engineered. Uh, the fact that it happens to be uh, skeletonized, if anything, just reduces the uh, weight of the gun a little bit, probably by a half an ounce altogether. Um, another thing that you'll notice is right here, this is called the, the sear. This is, this is the double action sear, this black part right here. That's what, that's what pulls the hammer back on this part of the uh, trigger. This is called the this is called the uh, rear hook of the trigger and that pulls back that's the cam of the trigger and that pulls back on that sear. That sear now is uh, basically just an inserted part and it does not have to be cut at the factory. You know I had to learn uh, many many uh, after many many unsuccessful tries I had to learn how to uh, properly cut the seat and let me see if I have uh, I should have some of those in my parts here. Um, maybe uh, here's a I believe this is a this is a Smith and Wesson K-frame sear and we had to learn how to cut the seat of this sear on this side and we had to learn how to cut adjust the long cut and the short cut and the reason we had to adjust that, and we used, we used what was called a Barrett file, that was, this, that was this puppy right here, we used that for a number of things. We used that to uh, adjust the ratchets on the uh, ejector, and we also used it to, to cut these uh, to fit the gun. The reason we had to cut them to fit the gun was because in those days you didn't have CNC machining. You didn't have, you didn't have the ability to uh, perfectly uh, machine parts. You also didn't have molded parts. Now, you know, that takes on a very, very, uh, <laughs> for some stupid reason, that takes on a bad connotation. A molded part is to some people some sort of a problem. You know, this, we have metal, metallurgy and technology these days that is uh, vastly superior to some of the uh, crude, antiquated things that we had to do years back. Molding a part does not mean that it's uh, weak. It does not mean that it's going to fall apart. Uh, quite a number of high-grade gun manufacturers have invested thousands and thousands, countless thousands of dollars, millions of dollars in uh, this sort of process to uh, either MIM a part or to investment cast it. Investment casting is some of the hardest metal known to man because they use it on they use it on the fans of uh, jet engines so you know those rotate those rotate uh, unceasingly at high RPM that would shatter uh, a lesser metal so don't don't immediately think that just because it says MIM or if it's an in investment cast part that it means it's inferior not by any means. Uh, when when parts were when parts were uh, broached, I'll show you, here's an old uh, hammer that, well, it's unfortunate, some, some guy who previously uh, owned an N-frame Model 29 decided he was going to do his own gunsmithing and he, he, wrecked, he wrecked the uh, caulking notch. The caulking notch is only six to seven thousandths of an inch deep and he thought by stoning it he could improve his uh, single action pull. Well, he just, in those days, this, I think this, this hammer was, uh, I think it was about eight or ten dollars or something. It was very expensive in those days. These days, it'd probably be closer to, it'd probably be closer to forty or fifty dollars, I imagine. Uh, and it was a nice target hammer with a target spur and everything. But all these cuts in those days had to be, after this part was uh, hammer forged, it had to be, uh, all these cuts had to be made with what was called a tower brooch. A tower brooch was a thing that a guy climbed up on about a story and a half high and there was a long, there was a long traveling like a file that was tapered. It would gradually, it would gradually come into these surfaces and cut them away. Not the most precise 
process in the world. Uh, we're talking about monstrous machinery that's trying to make tiny little cuts on these parts. And as a result, you didn't have, uh, you didn't have what you call very close tolerances. Tolerances were wide enough so that when you combine them together, when you had the trigger and the sear and the hammer and all these other parts and, and the, the rebound block and all these other parts interacting with one another, uh, nothing worked unless somebody with skilled hands uh, knew how to uh, use a Barrett file and uh, other files and, and uh, how to make everything come together. Uh, it, was a, it was an arduous process. It was an unnecessary process and it's, it's not some, it, it, it does not mean that guns were made better in those days. That is the biggest bunch of baloney I've ever heard. It means that they had, they had to learn how to do things to uh, basically turn a piece of junk into a fine working uh, instrument. They had, to, they had to learn how to take a gun that would be absolutely inoperative, it would be impossible to pull the trigger, impossible to pull the hammer, the cylinder wouldn't spin, it wouldn't even insert into the gun. You had to spend, you had to spend a long time putting these guns together. That's not necessary anymore. One of the first things I'm going to draw your attention to, right here on the, right here on the, cover plate. You'll notice that you notice that everything is black and everything is everything has got swirly marks on it. That was done that was done by precision machinery that made this and it was ready to go when it was all done. You notice right here these bosses this this is called this is called the uh, hammer boss and there's there's other there's there's a also hammer boss on the uh, inside of the frame this didn't have to be filed when I was when I was at this when I was at the armor school and when, when whenever we installed a new uh, hammer or trigger we actually had to take we actually had to take a flat file a Nicholson file and and adjust the height of that boss because it may not have uh, it may not have uh, sandwiched correctly with the trigger and, or the hammer and caused and caused basically to to lock up just like just like disc brakes, so that was a very that was a very uh, important change. So th this is a precision made uh, piece of uh, steel now. It's no longer something that has to be adjusted on all these different surfaces. It's ready to go. Uh, similarly with with the rest of the gun, I'll I'll go ahead and I'll take apart some of this and I'll show you uh, what I mean. Okay, here's a close up look at that uh, hammer. One thing that uh, I think is very, very intelligent uh, design change was the incorporation of a quick attaching stirrup. That's what this, that's what this is right here. This is the stirrup that connects to your main spring uh, that drives the hammer. Uh, in, in, the old, in the old style, that stirrup was connected with a, a pin that had to be driven into place and sometimes it cramped up, sometimes it stuck on the side of the frame or the, or the side plate and had to be uh, made flush. And so it was just one of those other little problematic things that could go wrong. Now we have a stirrup that just simply sits in, its, sits in a keyway. Uh, it's, it's an intelligent engineering change. I don't see anything. I would prefer that greatly over the uh, previous design. Uh, and again, here's the, here's the sear. The sear very very intelligently now it's, it's got a spring loaded it's got a spring loaded back to it the same as the old style sear but now it's just simply uh, placed right in right in a slot and it doesn't have to be adjusted what a wonderful what a wonderful change that is I wish I had had that when when I was an armorer that's a good design change. Uh, another thing on the hammer, you know, sometimes the people who talk about complaining about things, I wish they'd at least learn the proper terminology. This is not a this is not a firing pin. That's called a Smith and Wesson hammer nose. They've eliminated that uh, stinking device. That hammer nose was prone to breaking. That hammer nose was nothing but problems. 
The reason why they used a hammer nose instead of a firing pin, which they used, by the way, a firing pin is nothing new in a Smith & Wesson revolver, was used in their 22 caliber, 22 long rifle uh, combat masterpiece. And it requires, uh, a, ha it requires a hammer a bushing, a firing pin bushing, it requires a firing pin, a firing pin spring, and a firing pin retaining pin. So those, those things were more costly to manufacture than this cheaply riveted in place old hammer nose that was prone to breakage and, and bending and all sorts of things. So another great innovative change. They've gone to something which is more functional by eliminating that, by eliminating that uh, pesky hammer nose and now having a good, uh, highly intelligent a hammer that strikes a spring-loaded firing pin. Much better. Here's the close-up of here's the firing pin retaining pin. Remember that has to also be drilled. That's an operation that has to be drilled at the factory. Uh, that that just sits in there by gravity. Here's the firing pin and here's the firing pin bushing right here that uh, holds the, the assembly together and inside that there is a coil spring. So it's more costly. It's not cheaper. It's more costly. Now I've heard it said, you know, that the, the people at the Smith & Wesson factory now wouldn't know what the people at the Smith & Wesson factory knew back then. Well, you know, they're repairing and maintaining these old guns. They know, they know what they know what they're making and how it was assembled. Uh, there are still people around there that learn how to uh, disassemble and maintain the old style guns and how to fix them. Now, again, as I showed you on the side plate, the the interior of this gun is just as smooth as can be. It's no there's no there's no rough machine marks that we used to have in the old guns. There's no high bosses that had to be uh, that had to be uh, dealt with. Uh, everything is very, very precise uh, and it's ready to go. So what's this little deal right here? Well, that's, that's the one thing probably I, I'm never going to use it. Uh, you put what looks like a handcuff key in the other side and that's the, that's the safety, you know, the childproof safety to prevent uh, anybody from firing the gun. I, it's aesthetically, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't please me, but it doesn't hurt my feelings either. I mean, I'm not, I'm not such an overly uh, worry wart that I'm going to worry about the fact that it's just got that little, that little hole in the side of the gun, which I n never have to use. It's nothing that can go wrong. It's not, it's not going to accidentally turn and, and, you know, cause a malfunction or anything like that. Uh, it possibly, for somebody who does have uh, you know, children in the family or something, it might possibly save somebody's life. So, you know, it's not a bad thing to have. Um, while I'm on the topic of the frame, you'll notice that it doesn't have, somebody has been complaining that it doesn't have a barrel pin anymore. It doesn't need a barrel pin anymore because the barrel's not screwed in that way. This barrel is a two-piece barrel that is shrouded. The interior of this barrel, the, part, the, working, the working part of the barrel is made of stainless steel and it's shrouded with blued steel. A beautiful design. Uh, by doing that they were able to incorporate the best of both worlds, the beauty of the blued steel and also the functionality of a very hard, tough stainless steel uh, barrel. That barrel is now uh, screwed in independent of the shroud. That means that rather, you know, when I, when I had to fit, when I had to fit a cylinder at the factory or adjust, adjust the, the cylinder gap, we did it by, we did it by hand file. That's how we adjusted the cylinder gap uh, on a Smith & Wesson was with a hand file. That was a very crude way of doing it. You know, we used to have a standard saying in the, in the class, file flat, file flat. Everything was filing flat because if you filed at an angle, you might have uh, eight thousandths clearance on one side and two thousandths clearance on the other side. 
you're supposed to have four thousandths of an inch clearance. I checked this I checked this revolver with my feel of gauges. It took the four thousandths and it would not take the five. That's pretty fine to me. And that was the same on both sides, top and bottom. Everything is absolutely perfect. So they've by re-engineering the barrel, they've also incorporated a beautiful uh, beautifully designed uh, cylinder gap that will not go wrong. So, another good feature. Let's step forward to the... this is probably one of the more problematic areas in the old Smith & Wessons of all. And I spoke about this at length in the previous video that I did. And again, I encourage you to watch that video because that will give you detailed instructions on how to properly disassemble and uh, maintain your own Smith & Wesson within within reason. It's, it, this is not an armorous course. The first thing I want to note is that the what we used to call what we used to call the yoke button up here it was actually it was actually a uh, button that w the the cut went all the way around in its full 360 degrees and it left a button on the top and that button was dragged on by a screw which we called a the yoke screw and that yoke screw bore against the side the inside of that button and along its along its edge uh, it didn't take very long for that for that yoke button to wear down after repeated openings and closings and, and, and to get battered on in firing so that uh, you ended up with end shake. The, the, whole, the whole yoke would slide in and out of its frame. Well, Smith & Wesson has recognized that problem and they've addressed it and now they have a properly fitted screw with a pointed end which engages now instead a perfect a, a perfect slot in the side of this in the side of this yoke, which no longer uh, is going to batter it. It's it's a precise fitting thing that that bears on both sides uh, of that screw rather than just on one tangent surface. That was a real pain in the neck. Uh, you know we went through we went through. Uh, yoke screws uh, like they were like they were water. I mean, we just constantly in this in the police department we were constantly replacing yoke screws, and then after the yoke screws would no longer work, I had to start doing physical work with a peening block and uh, you know a, with a four ounce uh, ball peen hammer, working on that uh, and with with gauges and everything else to restore it to uh, operating condition until it went sour again which it was going to do. It was inevitable. This is the sort of thing that I find in all these old guns. And that's why I won't touch them because probably if, they, if they've got looseness now, uh, it's, it's very severe and it may not be restorable without really dif disfiguring the gun. Um, the, rebound, the rebound block is uh, pretty much, as far as I can tell, it's the same piece of uh, hardware that it used to be but they've improved it because now they can they can cast these parts so that rather than having to install a pin in the side of the rebound block the rebound block now has an integral pin that's a good thing anytime you have an integral pin or an integral part rather than a separate part that can that can drift out or get hung up or whatever uh, get misadjusted that's a good thing that's a good design change let's look at the trigger the trigger, my friend, has got, as far as I can tell, it's got the same geometry as is the is the old trigger right here, and here's the new. As far as I can tell, they're the same, the same basic geometry. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if the old one would work in the new gun, uh, but it would have to be the pivot hole right here is very small diameter on the on the old style trigger and it was not as rugged and durable that that pin is a smaller pin than what is used now which is much much larger hole much more durable and less likely to, 
to bend. And that, that added benefit means that you're going to have a better mechanical action of the gun. The hand now is also a I don't see I don't see an exposed I don't see, a, see see an exposed stud on the other side which tells me that this pin is also integral to the hand a nice little upgrade other than that it seems to uh, be the same basic function and design it has the same the forward portion is called the throat of the uh, the throat of the hand the uh, trigger lever that's a great new design change. Here's this old trigger lever here. This trigger lever, that's this, that's this part here that pushes back and forth uh, and restores, restores the gun to battery, the trigger to battery, by, the, by this rebound block. The rebound block engages it right here and pushes it back and forth and, and restores it to battery. Um, but that that trigger lever had to be installed with one, another one of these pesky little pins and you had to use a special device to get that pin started and you had to get the spring and you had to get uh, the uh, pin rather in in line with the hole inside this thing and it was a problematic thing to deal with now we have a trigger lever that is very intelligently designed with two legs on it on each side which engages an underside of this it goes into a raceway here in the bottom of the trigger and it doesn't need to be held in place with any kind of special device it's beautifully it's beautifully sm smooth well made and that slides in just like that without cramping up if you notice this one here now uh, has become has become it's, it's stiff it will not it will not move correctly and very frequently uh, that would happen when uh, a gun was became dirty street dirt would get in there and it would cause that to cramp up this one's not going to cramp up my friends this one here will not cramp up because uh, the way it's the way it's installed it's not on a it's not on a small fragile little pin this is probably one of the best this is probably one of the best things that Smith and Wesson ever did was to get rid of that lousy uh, ejector rod which was a shroud that went around the uh, center the center pin when the center pin became bent and it cramped up on that ejector rod that was the end of the operation of the gun and that happened anytime the cylinder got banged into that meant that if, a, if an officer accidentally dropped his gun, if, say in a confrontation, you know, maybe wrestling with somebody, his gun came out or, it, or it got banged into, that, that would cramp up the gun and cause it to be inoperative. Great design change. Finally, if you look underneath here, you'll notice there are three, there are three holes. There's one which is currently being occupied by the uh, strap on the adjustable sight but that once once that's removed it there's also two companion holes that serve as mounting points for uh, an optic of some sort so if you wanted to put a scope on it or you know red dot or something like that you've got the provision you don't have to go down to your local gunsmith and have them drill a hole into your uh, antique uh, Smith & Wesson which reduces its value great uh, addition there used to be a, a couple of gas gas rings right here and those gas rings were intended to uh, deflect gases from the uh, gas cylinder gap deflect them and prevent them from getting inside the barrel of the yoke well they weren't that effective they tried different methods and they slotted them in different and different things now they've got now they've got a very nicely designed uh, it looks flat but it's somewhat curved and that will that will really deflect gases better and seals up that port so that they can't just creep in with dirt and crud and get that cylinder all bound up uh, they've done a nice job with this. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a fine piece of machinery that I wish 
uh, if I had if I had that sort of uh, thing to work with when I was an armorer, uh, it would have cut my workload down significantly. And I, to be very honest with you, some of the problems that we used to have back then wouldn't even occur because uh, you know six or seven different problems occur with with that uh, with that design, the old design of the yoke. Uh, a number of problems occurred with uh, the hand in those days. Uh, a number of problems occurred with the sears. Everything was a problem. Uh, as I showed you, there were 51 problems that we learned to correct, many of which don't even, they're not even possible anymore. And that's why I think that's a significant reason why Smith & Wesson can now offer a lifetime uh, warranty on these things. Uh, they certainly didn't before, my friends. Uh, you know, when you when you had a Smith & Wesson that uh, was brand new out of the box, uh, it took quite a while for that gun to get uh, broken in so that it would uh, spin freely. Uh, they, they made it with very, very tight tolerances so that, uh, you know, they knew that it would loosen up because of design flaws. There was, there was flaws in its design that literally loosened up uh, over time and, and never stopped loosening. And also, finally, this has got... You know, this this was an addition that was not on the original Model 19s. Uh, it was only available on certain uh, end frame models, like the Model 29 and the Model 25 and things like. And the the 41 Magnum, they had the they had the uh, red they had the red insert in the Bowman uh, front blade, but that was not available on the Model 19. So it's really it's really cool. I like it. Uh, I'll get this gun back together and we'll take another quick look at it. So there you have the return of a classic handgun indeed. I'm not at all offended by them calling this the classic. No, it's not. It's not this old gun. It has the same beauty, but it has so many more refinements, so many more upgrades, that it has a right to its own heritage. And I, I really uh, want you to understand that this is not some sort of a setback in the history of Smith & Wesson. This is, this is many steps forward incorporating all the new technology that's available, not to reduce the quality of the gun, but to improve it. And they really have improved it. Uh, their, their lifetime warranty uh, speaks volumes. So there's one other little item right here that I want to make note of. The Model 19 had a trigger stop which was installed behind the trigger here. And oftentimes, I recommended uh, that could sometimes get out of whack. It was held in place by a by a screw uh, under friction, and at times that could uh, turn and get out of adjustment. And you, you your trigger really didn't have uh, correct over travel uh, in order to disengage in single action. Uh, and I would tell sometimes if if people were having problems with that loosening up, to just uh, take it out. Uh, this gun doesn't need to have uh, an over-travel uh, trigger stop because uh, things are so precisely made that it doesn't have any uh, over-travel whatsoever. That, that trigger lets off in single action, uh, just as crisp as can be, uh, to exactly this, this, the book standard that uh, it, it called for back in the day, which was four and a half pounds. Uh, it can be lightened to less than that. I don't use single action very much, so I'm not going to bother and four and a half pound trigger pull on a on a uh, beautiful Smith and Wesson is uh, nothing, no problem to me whatsoever. I'm mostly a double action shooter, but this gun doesn't have to have that. So again, just running down, uh, you know, you you've got the same appearance as the old gun, with many improvements incorporating many new features and technologies that were not available in those days. So truly, this is the return of an old friend. Beautifully made. Engineering is 21st century now. Uh, this, is, this is as fine as it gets. It used to take a lot of work for me to get a double action working like that. And this is out of the box, friends. This is the way it came out of the box. Smith & Wesson didn't come out of the box like that unless you got it from the custom shop. Uh, this is just as smooth and as slick as could be. Uh, it's a fine operating piece of machinery that has all the glamour and looks of days gone by. A little hole in there, I'm not going to worry about that. I'm not going to lose any sleep about it. 
it's better than ever. Better than ever, friends. So don't listen to all the hype and all the baloney that you hear out there. Take it from an armorer, somebody who has worked with these for, for ever since the early 70s. This is an improvement. It's a better gun. It'll shoot better. And I can guarantee you it'll compete better for me. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe. God bless.